cool. Uh, just make sure we're live on Instagram. Hey, good afternoon. Hi, Dr. Sheehan, good to see you. Nice to see you. Hey, Jason, what's going on? Uh, it's good to uh, catch up with you all. Hey, Dr. Sheehan. Sounds, um, so like, guess, uh, sounds like Randy's not going to be able to join us. Yeah, it sounds like Randy's uh, got a pretty interesting case going on. So since it is about four o'clock, we are live on everything right now. Maybe we can get started. Um, you know, so welcome back to another edition of Tumor Talk, everyone. Uh, on this week's episode, it's a very special episode, uh, especially for me. We have um, uh, Dan Eichberg and uh, Dr. Carter Komatar from University of Miami here, along with special guest, uh, Dr. Simon Hampton, of course, Dr. Jason Sheehan, who's here from UVA. We're going to be talking about... Um, a new book that was recently published. Um, it's a pretty hot book right now. Uh, I've read through it and I think it's kind of amazing. Uh, surprise that nothing like this has come out so far. And um, it sort of goes over the, the business of brain tumors. Uh, Dr. Eichberg and Dr. Komatar put this together along with a couple of other authors and editors, um, you know, some of who are on this Zoom link here. Um, but I just want to maybe spend uh, a first, first, maybe the first third of this on going over the, the foundation for the book, where you guys got the idea, um, the sort of demand for it, and and sort of on the, along those lines. Yeah, I, I just right. wanted to interject one thing in that, uh, it, you know, as we speak, I just pulled it up, uh, number one new release uh, on Amazon for, for neurosurgery books. So it it's more than hot, it's, it's uh, risen to the top, so, but. Uh, go ahead, Rick. Uh, uh, give us your insights and how, how this sort of came about. Sure. Um, you know, this all came about. I, I've, I've given a bunch of uh, visiting professor talks um, around the country, and, and, and I'm sure Jason knows that when you give a visiting professor talk, you're always wondering what's your niche? Are you going to be talking about research or are you going to be talking about building a practice? Are you going to be talking about lab research or organized neurosurgery? Um, and I, I, you know, something that I'm most comfortable with and something that really is my strong suit is, is kind of building a practice and stuff that we've done here at Miami. And so after having given a bunch of visiting professor talks around the country, uh, it just came to mind that this should be in writing because every program that I gave the talk at, they were, there was such positive, um, you know, reviews and it was really um, accepted so well that I thought we should put it into a book form. Uh, Dan, who did our infolded brain tumor fellowship just a few years ago, is an outstanding resident, not only clinically, but also academically. Uh, so we got Dan involved. Um, I sent him my PowerPoint for my visiting professor talks and a little bit of guidance uh, about the techniques that I use. And within a few weeks, Dan just ripped out this book. <laughs> so it was kind of amazing. And then with just very few edits going back and forth, um, kind of fine tuning. Then we had a version that we could send to the editors. Um, obviously, Simon and yourself are on the editorial board. Uh, you guys have been a huge, uh, a huge advantage having you guys, uh, you know, edit the text. And then the final format just came about a few weeks ago. So <clears throat> obviously a huge team effort. Uh, everyone's been involved, uh, but really kudos to Dan who helped put the book together from scratch. Well, thank you. And Rick, it was your, you know, it, you're, you're the one who did it. It was your presentation and your guidance that really made it possible. And just sort of from a basic for people that don't know about the presentation. So when you're a resident like me, you go to the, you go to the hospital every day and you operate and the cases are just, they just appear for you. But then when you graduate, those cases don't necessarily just materialize for you. You, you realize that um, you have to do some additional work in order to convince patients that you're the best surgeon for them. It's a real question. How, as a new attending, are you able to convince people to see you instead of seeing somebody who has much more experience? And that's a uh, sort of a topic that isn't really covered in residency training. So we really felt that this um, need had not been met. So that was the kind of impetus for writing this book. Yeah, I yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. I would just say it, 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 it is one of those uh, things that that you finish uh, extensive neurosurgical training and uh, uh, oftentimes neurosurgical programs just don't provide this level of, of insight. And it's one of the most practical things that you need is how to build a practice uh, and to 
uh, uh, you know, to, to do what Rick's done so nicely and what you've outlined in, in the book, I think is, is something that isn't necessarily second nature to everyone. Uh, and, and, you know, there are things that I, I uh, as I read the book, I mean, I, 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 I thought, wow, this is the first time that someone's really consolidated these aspects, many of which, you know, or some of which it took me years to sort of figure out, well, if you do this, it has this benefit in terms of uh, patient care or this benefit in terms of practice. But um, Rick, uh, and, and Dan, what's your sense of, uh, you know, if you, um, I, you, know, you, you break this into chapters, D describe a little bit about the organization of the book and, and kind of uh, what you see as, sort of as the, the critical pearls of the book, uh, you know, if you're gonna give a, a synopsis. So I think that one of the main sure. focuses is that um, you're building practice not to increase your, you know, fame or ego or anything. It's really to improve patient care. There's a lot of really high profile papers that have shown something called the volume outcome effect, which suggests that surgeons that have more surgical experience in more cases tend to have better outcomes. Um, so we start the book with that perspective, with um, the idea that your, your best uh, advertisement for yourself is patients with great outcomes who tell their friends that um, they had a very good experience with you. Um, so we talk about how to uh, have great patient outcome, great clinical outcomes and avoid complications. Um, that's where we sort of start the book. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly right. You know, what Dan said is that, is that I think that when you finish residency, you think that the operating room is the most important part of your job. And it is, obviously, that's where you're taking care of patients. But what's very clear the moment you leave residency is that if you only work in the operating room and outside the operating room, you don't put in the effort that we describe in the book, then you'll never be successful because there's so much more, or you know, at least you won't hit your like entire potential because there's so much that goes into neurosurgery outside of the operating room that is never really discussed, that most residents have no idea about. And until you're out there as an attending, it, you really don't realize how much work goes into what you do outside of the OR. And that's what's critical. You know, we, uh, Rick, yesterday you and I were chatting um, you know, last night about sort of how you keep a patient from, say, you know, they come to see you with a brain tumor and how do you avoid losing that patient to somebody else, you know, especially when you're in a metro area that's competitive. Miami is a massively, you know, I'm literally staring at it right now. It's a massively competitive market, it's, you know, people everywhere. How have you over the last decade sort of established this? I mean, there's obviously a secret recipe that you've outlined in the book. And I don't want to give away too much, but how have you managed to pull this off where, you know, your, your centers, I mean, you alone are doing almost 700 brain tumors a year. It's kind of outrageous and amazing. Yeah. So I would say that, um, you know, a lot of it is reputation. So there's the early part in your career, and then there's the later parts in your career once you've already developed a reputation. If you're, once your reputation is formed, it's a lot easier to keep patients because people will come to you under the understanding that you are the best at what you do or one of the best at what you do and the best option. And the amount of you can do it you know, really becomes minimal. And, you know, my fellows will, will, will also comment that early on my first five years, it would take me 20 or 30 minutes in a room to basically explain to a patient why we were operating, what are we going to do and make sure they f felt comfortable. My current clinic, it's like a 30 second up or, you know, 30 second discussion because they're basically like, whatever you want to do, doc, whatever you want to do, because, because they've come to me with the understanding that, you know, there's a reputation behind what you're offering and the program excellence. So, you know, my recommendation would be for residents and for fellows, you got to spend time um, with high volume attendance. And as I told in the test yesterday, just because someone comes to your office with an operative tumor doesn't mean that you're going to do the operation. You have to convince them that you're the person to do that operation. And the way to learn that, obviously you're gonna learn it on your own, but it's to spend time with high volume attendings who have already perfected that trade and kind of know how to describe the case, how to make a patient feel at ease, you know, inspiring confidence. That's a, 
there's no recipe for that. It's really an art to be able to portray confidence and security to a patient such that they're going to let you open up their head. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's always an honor to take care of patients, neurosurgical brain and spine patients, that's for sure. And it's one that makes amazing what they entrust upon you to, as you said, to, to let someone open up your head and, uh, or, or your spine and, and, and uh, do a complex procedure. It, you know, one of the things that I think is, um, is interesting about the book is, is your talk about uh, social media. I mean, we're on a social media platform now talking about typically uh, articles and, and new research and things like that. But how, how has social media changed the way neurosurgeons interact with patients, referring physicians and, and colleagues? Yeah. You know, where do you, where... So I would say that, you know, uh, social media has moved from being something for kids, something for fun, to being a major avenue for business revenue and, 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 and marketing and PR. Uh, if you look at the number of people under the age of 50 or 60 that are on some form of social media, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, it's like 80, 90%. And so if you think about it, you just have to remember that anytime someone gets referred to you, doesn't matter who they are, for the most part, they're going to Google you and they're going to check you out on, on either Instagram or Facebook or Twitter. And so, you know, I think the sooner you realize that social media has become and will always be the face of your practice, people need to look on social media and see something that tells them that you are a good surgeon with good outcomes, who is up to date, doing cutting edge research, doing cutting edge techniques. And so social media has gone from being a pastime to being almost required if you want to be competitive in a major market. Because again, you know, patients don't know who a good surgeon is unless they are a doctor themselves. They get referred to you. So they're going off of that. But, uh, but other than that, they don't know what a good surgeon is. And if someone's social media and someone's website looks like crap, they look at it as being like, well, why doesn't he have a better social media? Why aren't his articles listed on Google? You know, why doesn't he have, you know, a good presence? And I think that patients really seek that nowadays. Yeah, the, it, you know, it's, it's interesting. I mean, you, read, you said a couple of things uh, throughout the, this webinar so far that brought back some memories. One uh, uh, was a, a comment by Laszlo Steiner, who, who told me at the, at the onset of my, my career, he said, the best marketing is no marketing. I, obviously, I disagreed with him at that point, uh, but, you know, it was amazing at the time. It was true. I mean, he, you know, when there were only five gamma knives in the world, you could uh, uh, write a few articles and sit back in Charlottesville and patients would come to you. And he had a great reputation. He was a master surgeon. But, you know, as there became 130 plus radiosurgical units in the country or gamma knife units, not including LINAC based systems, suddenly the competition changed and, and the dynamics really changed. And you need to be reaching out and, and putting your message out there. Hopefully, you know, it's a positive one that resonates with patients. And then Ed Oldfield told me years ago, he said, you know, that it, you know, it's hard to become famous in neurosurgery. You really, you know, if you think about who's the, who's the most famous neurosurgeon is you know, Harvey Cushing. But if you walk down the street, you probably, and you asked a hundred people who Har Harvey Cushing was, I'd be surprised if you, if you got one or two people that would know who he is, if you didn't happen to run into a neurosurgeon or weren't at the WNS or CNS convention. <laughs> but the, uh, uh, you know, I think people know who you are, uh, 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 Dan, Rick, uh, you know, and, and they know that I think through, through your in interface with patients and the social media that, that uh, you know, that you put out there. So I think that you're not really looking to be famous, like, uh, uh, you know, uh, a, a um, pop star uh, uh, might be, you're looking to, to, to get your message out there. And I think that's how you use social media. Uh, I mean, you know, some influencer or, or uh, social media uh, uh, star may, may make, uh, you know, $100,000 a post, but that's not what your aim is. You're not, you know, so I think that that's the critical message. It's not, it's social media for the better of the patients, better of the care, and obviously to build your practice. And you've done that, you know, you outlined that very nicely in the, in the book. 
Yeah, I think patients are getting uh, much savvier, much more informed, and th that's all great things. And a lot of that has to do with the internet and social media, and there's just more opportunities for them to learn about different techniques or different surgeons and whatnot. So we're not really necessarily, you know, saying to do anything shady, but just to put, put your, your work right. out there, your good outcomes, your papers, things like that. And that's another data point for the patient to decide who the best surgeon is for them. And there was this perception, and I think Dr. Steiner, uh, you know, coming from a, a different generation had noted that maybe you really shouldn't be out there. You shouldn't be putting your name or, you know, uh, God forbid, I mean, you know, you're not a, uh, 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 putting yourself on a billboard or anything like that, but you're getting that message out there in a professional, consistent fashion. And, and I think you're right. It's hard for patients to know who the good doctors are uh, for a specific condition, much less, uh, you know, a, 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 a general condition like a, like a brain tumor, but even a specific type of brain tumor or location of brain tumor. And so what better ways do they have to, to do that than interfacing with their local and referring physicians, but also it, it, it's so common now for patients to get on the internet and to search you and to see what's out there on you. And you want to make sure that your, that information is your, your brand is, is, uh, is correct and, and clear. And, uh, hopefully you, you seem like a, an approachable person. Uh, so w one other question that, which I, I had as I sort of read through the book and, I, I, and this is likely evolved, but how much of the uh, of the uh, practice uh, in 2021 uh, for Miami neurosurgeons do you think is coming from direct patients seeking you out versus referring physicians or you know internists, PCPs, ER docs? Uh, how many people come to you for you know because? They found out about you maybe from a friend or, or uh, through their own internet searches versus coming through a physician, a standard traditional physician channel. So I, so I'll, I'll even break it down further. I'll say there's, there's three categories. There are people that come to the university for the university and then they get delegated to you. Right. Uh, then there's people who get referred to you directly, not the university. And then breaking down those direct referrals, there is, you know, a doctor referral to you. And then there's word of mouth or, or what have you. I would say university referrals, at least for me, is minuscule. It's well below 5%. I would say I can't remember the last time I saw a patient who came to the university and then got directed to me. The ones that get directly referred to me, the breakdown is probably three quarters from a physician at least, meaning that they saw a doctor who I worked with before, uh, who knows the work we do, and they refer that patient to Rick Comitar. Then there's about a quarter of the patients that, uh, you know, a friend of a friend you operated on, or I saw you on the internet or what have you. Um, that's probably about 20, 25%, I would say. You know, it's interesting what you said too, is that you know, as we look at these broader health systems, uh, there's this perception that um, uh, that the physician, that the referrals are coming to the health system. When in fact, I oftentimes think, as you've just attested, that the phys that the referrals are coming for the physician who just happens to work at that hospital, and and that uh, you know, if if you uh, look at uh, neurosurgeon A versus neurosurgeon B, they're not necessarily interchangeable in how they might establish and, and maintain and build and grow referral patterns. And I think you touch upon that too, in terms of making sure that your practice has the resources it needs be, uh, as, you know, from the institution that you're practicing in, because they're, they're benefiting from this and, and uh, the patients you bring in and there also is this tremendous uh, 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 halo effect that my guess is uh, that patients may come to see you, but then they may come to see uh, other colleagues, both in neurosurgery and radiology and radiation oncology and neuro-oncology and neurology. Uh, you might not even operate on them, but they've come to see you and, and that that's the, you know, sort of that recipe that you've got to make sure that the institution understands that so they adequately resources. So you've got the clinic resources and the OR resources and all that that you need. I think your book describes that process pretty well. 
On that same so, token, though, um, oh, sorry, Dan, just one last, I wanted to add to Dr. Fien's comments there. On that same token is that, you know, there's every industry we look at, you know, whether it's electric cars or whatever, maybe there's always a, there's always a, a front runner. And the front runner is not necessarily based on just quality alone. It's based on customer service. And since we're going to call it the business of brain tumors, and, you know, we typically avoid the word business in, in, in the medical sense, but it is a business at the end of the day from that aspect. You know, sort of customer service is something I wanted to talk to both Rick and, and Dan about, especially from Dan's perspective, from a resident perspective, because it's something we don't necessarily think about always in residency. But if you guys can touch on that too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I think there's there's two aspects to that analogy. So number one is making patients feel that they're cared for. And you know, obviously, first and foremost is having excellent clinical outcomes. But number two is just having a relationship with the patients, rounding on them twice a day, taking the time to sit down and have a conversation, understand their anxieties and what their concerns are. Um, so I think that goes a long way. Even in patients who have a complication, if you spend the time to explain what you're going to do to fix the complication, um, a lot of times, you know, they're aware that, you know, surgery is risky business. There's always a risk of a complication. But if you take the time to um, guide them through that complication, that really goes a long way with them. So that's, that's one aspect of it. And then the other aspect is keeping the referring physician uh, up to date. So we're not the only, you know, as neurosurgeons, we're not the only physicians taking care of these patients. They may have an oncologist, a primary doctor, an ophthalmologist. And uh, these other doctors also care a lot about the patients as well. So it's important to keep them in the loop, let them know what the plan is, let them know that surgery went well, let them know what the follow-up is. And uh, the doctors, the referring doctors really appreciate that. A lot of the time they haven't been called by other surgeons before for an update. And that goes a long way towards having them send future patients to you. Simon, so, mean, you, you, uh, I, oh, I, I just wanted to go back to what Jason was saying originally, <clears throat> that the, you know, what the book points towards uh, is the traditional battle that goes on uh, that I'm sure Jason knows about. It's the university academic setting versus the singular surgeon, meaning that the university tries to make websites very plain, very traditional. They limit your templates because the university wants to make surgeons interchangeable. They want it such that if Jason leaves the next day, the next person comes in and nothing is lost. The same with me. And they really envision surgeons as interchangeable when obviously we're not. And so what you want to do as a surgeon is you really want to create a brand. You want to create a reputation, an image, a brand such that the university doesn't control you anymore. And that's very difficult to do, but the principles of the book basically tell you how you can build a brand, how you can take control of that patient population. And one of the big things about my talk is that if you control the patient population, meaning if those referrals are coming to you and not the university, you now have control. If they're coming through the university and you don't work on a brand and you just wait for the university to trickle down a couple of referrals here and there, you've got no control and the university owns you and they can tell you what to do and you have no leverage. If you control the patient population with the halo effect and how much comes from downstream revenue of these referrals, you know, now you're in the driver's seat. And if you want different equipment or different OR time or different resources, you have that leverage over the university. But that's a very traditional battle that goes on at any academic center. They don't want surgeons to be individualized. They want you to be interchangeable, which is obviously different than what surgeons, you know, will aspire to do. No. Yeah, I, I agree with you at, uh, in that uh, it is that constant sort of uh, uh, tug uh, back and forth. We, but the interchangeability of, of surgeons, I've seen you know, those who do or don't follow the, some of the principles in your book, it, it, you know, the surgeons are not particularly interchangeable. I mean, their personalities and likes and, and dislikes in terms of case, case preference and volumes uh, are oftentimes radically different. So, Simon, you've been quiet and we'll just pull you into the conversation here towards the end, I apologize. But uh, you, you did a fellowship in Miami, you're now up at Westchester Medical Center, I believe. And, and tell me, have uh, you were editor or one of the editors of this book, uh, are the principles outlined in the book, uh, do you feel pretty uh, consistent with what 
you see as a practice building opportunity in New York? Because uh, I certainly saw that those as being valid, you know, in my in my area, my geographic area of Virginia. But talk a little bit about that if you mind. Yeah, absolutely. Thoughts. I mean, I you know, I'm very I was Rick's fellow going on seven years ago and very close with Rick, watched him, really shadowed him very closely to learn that aspect of his practice, you know, the art of practice building. And then obviously he's an extremely close friend of mine and we, and we maintain constant communication. So, yeah, I mean, I've definitely applied these principles in the book to the best of my ability and you see the fruits of that labor. I mean, there's no question that um, when you when you go about it this way systematically in terms of communicating with physicians and following up and all the, the emphasis and good outcomes, you definitely see the product of that. I mean, you definitely see your practice build and, and develop um, ways in which I think Rick and Dan have taken it to another level since I was there were really kind of the embrace of social media, which has always been kind of a controversial issue for physicians for various reasons historically like the neurosurgeon you mentioned, there's been this aversion or resistance to marketing yourself. You should kind of be above that in the world of medicine, but that's just kind of out the window now because there are all these competing healthcare systems and marketing and getting your message out there is just, is essential now. You can't really avoid that. Um, one thing I think that I've encountered that's, be, that's made the, the sailing a little bit rougher uh, um, has been the consolidation of healthcare systems and these mergers. And it's something you were touching upon a little bit before. It'd be interesting. I, I know we don't have that much time, but to hear what Rick and Dan have to say, you know, when you have private practitioners out there who kind of don't know where to turn, kind of corralling them and, and convincing them and proving to them that they should send you patients is a little bit uh, is a little bit more straightforward. But now when that physician group or that physician individual is now partnered with a rival healthcare system, which is a lot of what we're seeing nationally and especially in kind of the greater New York area where I practice, it becomes a little bit harder. They may love you. They may want to send you a patient. They may used to send you patients, but now they're part of a different system and they're really told, in fact, watched to see whether or not they're keeping their referrals within the system, not just neurosurgery, but oncology, et cetera. And it's a harder thing to combat as that stuff has kind of consolidated. So I'm just wondering, you know, what, what tips the authors have about that kind of, that phenomenon and Jason. Yes. Well but, no, it's a great point. Uh, uh, Rick, Dan, what, what are your thoughts? Hey, Dan, you want to take that one or? Sure. I mean, it's definitely, it's definitely a challenge. Um, I mean, it, it also kind of depends on the resources that the hospital has, but, uh, you know, there are, there are some sort of, um, plans that like, especially in like managed care settings, like, uh, like, you know, bundles that you're able to do to entice people over. But, you know, I would say that like some, some, some aspects of that are, you, you can't overcome them, but I think a lot of the, you know, lessons and stuff in the book are, are still useful. And like, you know, you, you have to just do the best that you can and try to, um, go, go around those things. Yeah. So, I mean, just to expand on that, I would say, just like Dan said, you know, you can definitely have carve outs, insurance carve outs, because tumors are relatively rare compared to other conditions that the hospital treats like appendectomies or what have you. <clears throat> so what we did early on was we worked with the hospital to form carve outs such that even though the hospital or the university may not take insurance A or X or whatever, we work and say, fine, maybe you don't take insurance X for cardiac disease, which maybe is pretty common, but for brain tumors, you'll do a carve out and you will accept that insurance. So you have to work with the hospital to hopefully get some carve outs. We haven't carved out every insurance. There's certainly insurances, which we don't take, but there's a lot of insurance that the university doesn't take or the hospital doesn't take. And we have through volume and through proving that our outcomes are better you know, fewer um, readmissions, fewer complications, shorter hospital stay, put that data together, show the insurance companies, they're going to want to work with you because you're saving them money compared to some person at a private hospital who maybe length of stay for a case is four to five days, readmission rates much higher than yours. If you can prove that the insurance company um, is going to want to work with you. So we, so we got carve outs during our first couple of years 
And then if you really don't take the insurance and it's a symptomatic tumor, end it through the ER. There's nothing wrong with that. If it's an asymptomatic tumor, that's, that's a little bit different. But there's numerous times where I'm referred a case and I see the films and it's, it's a large tumor. Patient has a neurological deficit. We don't take the insurance. I say, come to the ER. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that because the person has a symptomatic tumor. You are the best at, at taking care of, you're doing what's best for the patient. Uh, and they come in to the ER and that should be covered by their insurance because they're symptomatic. Well, um, yeah, I'm going to just say completely agree. I mean, I think those carve outs are critical uh, and that you've got to be at the table with your, with your hospital when they're discussing uh, uh, contracts with private payers, or at least they should be consulting you because you know, the brain tumor operations that you're, that one performs and adjuvant therapy and other sorts of things, they're not that commonplace. I mean, they, you know, you're not talking about uh, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, care of, uh, you know, for otitis uh, externa or otitis media, you know, where, where you got a, a, an E&M visit and some antibiotics for the most part. So, I mean, these are very expensive procedures. You want to make sure they're done well, and I uh, hopefully want to avoid the complications and readmissions rates. Well, my plug uh, is, uh, uh, you know, hopefully this is, book's going to head to the Oprah Book Club or something. That's that's my uh, my, my my goal for this webinar. Nitesh, your final thoughts? Uh, yeah, so I, you know, I just want to I want to thank everyone for tuning in today. You know, Dan and Rick, thank you so much. Simon, especially you, last minute coming in, uh, and Afshin, of course. You know, one thing um, I definitely want to sort of save as a teaser for everyone out there listening today. Um, you know, having been trained by Simon Hanft and, you know, being, uh, you know, Rick's current fellow, um, you know, one of the things that have been emphasized to me that we didn't necessarily touch upon too much was we, we talked about surgical excellence and customer service, but sort of building a culture of excellence, a team building. It takes a lot more than just you as a surgeon or as a provider to create a brain tumor program or a program of, any, of anything. And, um, you know, I first had experienced that with Simon Hanft, who was at Rutgers during most of my residency training. And, you know, have knowing Rick for, quite a few years now, I will say that, you know, I'm looking forward to learning more about that today. And I think I, I think that's pretty well explained in the book. Um, there's a large portion of the book dedicated to that. So I recommend everyone go on Amazon, buy it. I'm not sure if the Kindle version is still free. Buy it, leave a review. And, um, you know, I think, uh, I think it's very valuable for everyone. Thanks everyone for joining. And uh, I, I concur. It's great, great, uh, many, many pearls in there. Uh, that took, took years for most of us to realize. Thanks for putting this together and joining us today. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Right, See guys, you next thanks week. for having us. Take care. Take care. Take care, guys.